the Why Not people. That's how we are all gathered here. So I was a lucky one. I was a wanted kid. She really wanted to have me. Uh, in her, my mother's family, none of the women was a businesswoman. So all of the family was raised, well educated, to become a nice housewife, a good caretaker, somebody who can raise the kids with full devotion, with full love. So uh, she was uh, attending the law school, uh, but actually the law, being a lawyer was never a part of her destiny. The family was never asking, why not become a lawyer? For her, the destiny was to get married. My father comes into the scene. He's uh, well-educated, makes a good living. The families are too similar to one another, and there's this uh, settlement and love together. So they got uh, married. And my mother dropped college in law school at the third year, and her mission in life was become a mother. So there come, I come to the scene. Three and a half years later, I had a brother. I owe, him, I owe him a lot because he made me grow up much quicker than I would, actually. I was three and a, three and a half years old and I was told, you're a grown-up now. You're a, <laughs> you're a grown-up now. You have a brother to take care of. You have to take care of him. That actually embedded in myself that I have to take care of the people that I love. My beloved ones are my responsibility. That has been one of the, one of the major things in my life. Still. When you ask about the beloved ones around you, the people you work for, are you responsible for them? Yes, I am. In the future, I'll tell you how huge a burden is that to, to take yourself accountable, responsible for all the people around you if you're running a business of 150 people or 200 people. So what happens to them has an impact on you. Is that the way we should run the life? I'm questioning about it. So years passed. Um, my father was around 40, I was eight, and my father started to have stress-related health issues. And it was very common at that time that people had a sudden heart attack because we weren't going checkups like that, so they were having a sudden heart attack. So my father's stress-related related issues became my mother's nightmare. Because if something goes wrong to my father, what is she going to do? She's at the age of uh, 30, 32 with two kids. Is she going to go back to the family's house? Her, her parents' house? Is she going to keep the rest of her life there? This has become the major, the major fear in my, father, in my mother's life. So she decided she cannot go back and change her uh, future, but she said, I'm not going to let my daughter to face a similar fear. So I'm going to raise a daughter which is going to be totally independent at what no means, and she's not going to face this fear at all. So while at the age of eight, I mean, her basic fear was to keep this family together, healthy and safe, uh, and that has been her real life challenge. So all the time I was growing up, the, the words that I used to hear, kafanın dışını değil, içini süsle, decorate the inside of your, uh, my, the inside of your head, not the outside. The second thing, the biggest jewelry you can own your, in this world is your profession. You need to have a profession. You have to be independent. Love, marriage, you can find it at any age. Your mission in life is to have your own job, to stand alone on your own. So these were the things I was growing up with. And I still, these are the words when I'm thinking about my mother, these are the things that keeps on resonating in my mind. So what happened is that I said, why not? If my mother says this is the right way to go, I, that should be my future. While I was getting ready for this presentation, I was looking back in my pictures. So I found this picture, why a young girl enjoys such a typewriter? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why I don't have not one single picture playing with my dolls? And I remembered, I used to put two chairs together, the long edges of the chairs, and make it a small rectangular room, and that becomes my office. But that would be the way that I was playing. <laughs> So uh, I was looking at this picture in my primary school, and the way, I mean, that looks much adult than a primary school girl. I think there was something in me, beyond my mother's mission that she had embedded in me, I think there was something in me too that was coupled together. So another why not came along. My mother, she wanted to go to uh, uh, the English high school for girls. She enrolled, she took the exam, but she forgot to sign off the uh, admission form. So her examination was canceled because it was a piece of paper with no signature on. So she said, you should go to English high school. 
what I did. I entered English high school, <laughs> and I started where I started growing uh, in English high school for girls. So this was my high school years. Of course, the next is. No, undoubtedly, was to join uh, the university, and the best university at that time was Bosworth University. So I joined Bosworth University. Those were the times that I realized now that I'm grown up. I was grown up at three and a half, but 18, still grown up, much more grown up now. I had to start to earn my own money. So I went to my, father, to my mother and said, look, there is this guiding opportunity. Everybody is becoming a professional tourist guide. There's too much money in it. Daily fares is quite high. Uh, these are the years 87, 88, so you have to go back and remember those were the times where really uh, Anatolia was not the safest place on earth. This was the first time that the PKK, the old Kurdish things were starting all over. So I said to my mom, I want to become a guide. And she said, why not? <laughs> so actually at the age of 18, with a totally unknown driver and with a totally unknown muavin, I was wandering around the whole of Anatolia, 18 days. The tours was much, young, much longer at that time. So I packed myself up. I was in the bus with the two people, and I was traveling for 18 days, coming back. And there were people that were trusting me, those Americans, they're coming all the way. <laughs> they were coming all the way from US, and this 18-year-old was taking care of them telling them where to do, what to do, what to eat, what not to eat, where to go. So that, that really, thank you very much for Turkish Bin for giving me this opportunity. Because when you try to put your life together from a perspective, you realize you were born to be a why not. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I had to cherish my mom here because she had injected that confidence in me that I never thought, what am I doing at the age of 18? Those were the times the parents were keeping, trying to keep their girls at home. This was right after the 1980s with all these uh, coup d'etats and so forth. So they were trying to keep safe their children. And there's this girl wandering and traveling all around Anatolia. So of course, university, graduation, can't miss. So I started in my professional life. First of all, I started in Procter & Gamble. They were asking a questionnaire at that time in order to become a, a, a member of their marketing team. You have to put five cases of your leadership. If you're a guide, you have more than five cases of leadership. So it was such an easy uh, admission form for me. So I started Procter & Gamble. Totally coincidentally, I joined Young & Rubicum. There was an offer coming from uh, Young & Rubicum. So I started to work in Young & Rubicum in the advertising sector. I really liked the job and I really worked very hard. And through my career, I was coupled uh, with one of the greatest minds in uh, the advertising sector. So we became couples and we started to work together. And he was so determined, I was so determined. He really worked hard, I really worked hard. We even started to work during the weekends. With all this determinism and everything, we became one of those unbeatable couples. We took the agency from number eight position, became number one. We were so successful. And then he complimented me one day. He said, you know how grateful I am to you. You're almost 60% male. <laughs> so, <laughs> so imagine one of the biggest compliments that I have ever received in my business life is 60, being 60% male. That really, at that time, never occurred to me this is, this is a bad thing to say to a woman at the age of 29. I was really happy with it because I was dealing with high ego men, and I was dealing with high ego men in a manly manner, so this was okay. <laughs> so <clears throat> things were going really well, and uh, we were doing fine. He came to me one day and he said, you know what, I want to start up my own agency. It's time for me to start up my own business. It's, it's one individual's right to become an entrepreneur. He's, he's successful to be, with the business, so, so he said, you should come with me. I said, why not, at the age of uh, 30, 34, 33, that could, that could be a nice opportunity. Then we went to a cocktail, and in that cocktail, uh, a friend of ours was introducing me, and he said, every successful man has a woman behind, and let me introduce you. <laughs> this is our Zoom. <laughs> so this was really a big slap on my face. So am I working so hard to become the successful, uh, the, to become the woman behind a successful man? Is that my future? Is that the way I would like to continue? 
Actually, this is my first why not, my first true why not. Because like Cenk's father, my father said, at the age of 34, you will become a member, you will have be a partner in a successful agency. Clients are waiting for you there. How dare you reject? But there was something, a hunch, something in my, in, in my belly, the gut feeling. That's the first time I understand what the gut feeling was. I was waking up 4 a.m. every morning like there was something, there was something very uncomfortable in me. Why am I going with him? Should I go with him? Should I stay? And I choose to stay. And to tell you the truth, this why not, this trusting the hunch was the biggest decision I have ever made. And uh, I decided not to go with him. And he opened up his own agency. So I lost my creative partner. And just bear in mind that I'm in a creative industry. And the creative is the core of this business. So still, I go back and question, what the hell I was trusting? Here, <laughs> I should trust my mother and the confidence she injected in me. There was this feeling that I can do it. So I went back to my international partners, because this is an international agency. I said, give me a year. Do not release anyone within the agency, because while he was leaving, he took almost 40% of the business, 46% of the business with him. So I said, give me a year, do not release anyone, because if you start laying off people, then that, that's going to be an emotional burden. So give me a year, and we'll see, we'll show you what we can. And um, knock the wood, everybody, took, everybody understood the challenge I took on behalf of the rest of the agency. So they have supported me immensely. I owe a lot of thank yous for all of those people. So at the end, uh, instead of making a loss, we made a profit at the end of the year. So that had proved the market that we can do it. So this has been a major why not. It has teached me that I can be a woman that can stand on its own rather than a woman behind a successful man. That had teached my potential to me. So from this time on, that's, uh, I had amazing uh, years. I had worked hard, lived hard, uh, became successful. Uh, but then the people around me started saying like, Successful and strong women, they're always lonely. <laughs> Turkish women, Turkish men don't like successful women. They feel themselves quite, I mean, you, you know, the man should be the strongest one in the family. And I said, why not? Uh, and <laughs> that why not introduced me to this gentleman, uh, Batu. He has been in US, he lived in US for 17 years. He's an immunologist from a totally different world. Uh, he worked for National Institute of Health. Uh, I didn't understand a word of he said, and he didn't understand a word of I said when we were talking about our professional life. <laughs> so we, were in, we, we had so many friends around us, and the friends kept on saying, you know, you're a social butterfly, and he's an academician. I mean, you're having fun, good, but this could never work because you're coming from a totally different. I had this hunch, I had, there was something in his smile, there was something different in him that really respected who I am rather than pitying on who I was. So that had given me the urge and I said, why not? And we got married. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it looks like a fairy tale and I felt that it was a fairy tale. I was a successful woman, I was uh, really networking hard, uh, I had a, a mother who was like a cheerleader to me. She was supporting me on all, all, all aspects. It's the huge fan and a supporter because I have realized what she envisioned for herself. So I was uh, getting all the support that I needed. My clients loved me. So everything seemed perfect. And I really had this feeling that I can move the whole world around my fingers. Now that's a scary feeling. That's a very scary feeling. And since that day on, I realized when there's this feeling something wrong is coming along. What happened is that my mom had a cancer. And it, was all, it all happened very quickly. She had been diagnosed with cancer when I was at the age of 40. And I said, okay, I'm married to an immunologist. And it took only a day for him to organize us to go to uh, DC to take her into a, uh, a what is it called? Uh, a trial, uh, a trial uh, to participate in a trial. So I said, okay, I'm now, I have the networks. I mean, who would believe that I would get married to an immunologist? And he could do all of that. He's all connected well in DC. So we organized everything. I had the financial funds. But you know what? Because my equation in life, my success equation was, you work hard, 
your peak well connected, you account for all the odds, and then you, are t you start acting on those odds, and then you have the control of the whole thing. What happens is that all this game didn't work. My mother passed away in 10 months, and we couldn't do a thing. So at the end, it's, 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 you're losing your mom, you're losing your fan in life, but you're losing your success equation in life. So, I mean, all my life I worked for the, in order to make that success equation work. That has been my true north in life, and suddenly it's gone. So I start to question everything in my life. What am I doing? How am I doing? Why am I doing? So I realized that actually what I'm doing in life is, is especially in the agency, I'm connecting everyone. I'm trying to connect people. I'm connect, trying to connect people around the mission. So I take responsibility over people. I make sure that there's a safety net that not nobody falls off. These are all the things that I do as a woman, because as a woman, we are all asked to put things together, to put the family together. But I realized um, at the same time, WPP, my, uh, my holding company, invited me to take a place in X Factor. It's, it's a training to have more leaders going up. So I joined this X uh, Factor, and they asked me to make a portrait of myself. This is the first time in life I start to question, what am I doing, why am I doing? what I do and how I do. So this is my, this was, the, so this is my portrait. I start to feel that I'm in a spider net. It's a net that I created. It's a little bit dark because I take responsibility of all the people. I connect people. Uh, and because I take responsibility, I'm really tired and lonely uh, because as a responsible person, you try to take on what they're doing. So. This, this, is, this is one of those moments in life that you really question uh, yourself. In that training, they also teach us a concept. Are you a diminisher or a multiplier? And I said, okay, I'm a multiplier because I help people. I, I try to connect those people. I try to make sure that everybody is aligned, everybody has the same information, nobody falls off. It comes out that I'm not a multiplier, I'm a diminisher because I take on the responsibility of the people, or I make sure that they take their task, uh, they take task, their task significantly. I control them. I'm a control freak. I'm not a multiplier. I'm taking away the responsibility of the people. So I'm a diminisher. So everything I thought of myself was actually questioned. Uh, this was a little bit dark period of my life. It took about two years uh, to figure out who I am. Uh, and I found out this um, concept, which I really liked, which is the authentic self. Uh, because actually, the way we are shaped is by third, fourth generation inherited thoughts, what a woman should be, what a businesswoman should be. How is the work environment? Is the work environment managed by males? So there's some male donation and there's male uh, domination. And they make the way, they, they, they shape us. We start wearing dark colors. We start wearing suits. So is that who am I? Is that the way I should be? And then I start working on my authentic self. Who am I? What I want? What is a responsibility? What is not my responsibility? What do I like to be? And that journey really helped me a lot. A lot. I, I, I believe I'm more rooted. I'm more sincere to myself. And I have faced who, re, who I really am. So uh, I, this expression of my authentic self really made me a better leader and a better manager. And I see loyalty of the people, not because I demand it, but willingly they like to do it. So this is this whole line. This is how I feel myself. I used to ask my managers in Europe or in, uh, in the world to tell me, I, mean, I want this and I want to do that. Can I get your approval? Now that I know if I'm, as a woman, we have this huge creation power. We're, we're governed with this power, and basically all the societies is trying to submissively put that creation power down. When you realize your creation power, you can actually do anything. Now, I believe I don't need the authority or the approval of anyone to do what I dream of. And actually, my mom's missing in my life, again, told me a why not. Because if she was here and being a supporter of my life, maybe I would have never had this awakening. So I still over a lot. Thank you.